for uh, joining us today. Uh, my name is Hayley Jarvis. I'm the Head of Physical Activity um, at MIND. I've been in codes just over three and a half years working on all of our sports and physical activity work from grassroots. So I have a huge remit. So we deliver programs to get people access uh, to support their mental health and well-being. So when they have become unwell, there's a way to help their recovery all the way through to supporting um, elite sport, working with UK Sports, the English Institute for Sport, those associations and, and everything really in between. So um, hopefully today I can just share uh, some of our, our learning um, and a little bit of information about the work we do at MIND and, and hopefully give you some tools and ideas um, that you can put into practice in your own um, environment. Okay, bear with me. Brilliant. So um, I think we've already, already touched about microphones uh, and video, so if you could mute yourself if you haven't already, that would be really helpful. And um, there will be time to ask questions at the end, so by all means um, you can unmute yourself, you can have a chat. Uh, engagement is really important to me, so throughout I will ask um, for you to um, type out answers in your, in your chat box, just to see that you're still there. Um, and, and if you've got questions, please, please do ask. If you need to flag with that chat function, it pops up really quickly on my screen. So if we can try and keep it quite short, um, I'll do my best to answer as, as we go um, and ask questions at the end. Just also to say, this really is your session, so note down those questions, talk to me at the end. Um, we want you to get the most uh, out of this. And also in terms of supporting your own mental well-being. So we you know when we start talking about mental health, mental well-being, sometimes it can provoke memories or feelings in us. And if you need to take any time out, go grab yourself a cup of tea or a glass of water, by all means, um, do do that. It's really important that we all look after ourselves um, as well. Okay. Um, so in terms of what we're going to cover during the next um, hour and a half or so, um, we're going to look at the common perceptions and misconceptions about mental health and how that may play out in a swimming environment. Um, we're going to look at the barriers that people with mental health problems can experience in swimming and we've done lots of insight into this. Uh, we're also going to talk about stigma and discrimination, so they're, they're used quite a lot, particularly in the mental health um, context. So we're going to explore what they, they mean and how we can um, um, get rid of them and importantly look at practical things that you can do to create that positive environment and at the end of the session really look at where you can find post people to if they they need uh, help and support it's fair to say we are not expecting to be mental health experts at the end of this and certainly it's um, you know if, if you have more if you're really interested we definitely encourage you to access other other training there's lots out there also very aware, lots of people have lots of experience already, so it's really difficult trying to the level at this. So if you've got an example that you want to share during um, during the session, then, then please do so. Um, nobody's an expert on everything, so I think it's really important that we share and we learn from, from one another. Okay. Um, so we're MIND, a uh, mental health charity, so we're here to support anyone that has a mental health problem. Um, so they have somewhere to turn to for advice and support. So nationally, we uh, provide information services. We have an info line, a plethora of info on our, on our website about mental health problems and, and how to um, access self-support and what supports out there available, the legal advice service. We campaign for um, increased awareness, but also better access to services um, and do a lot of lobbying work with government. Locally, we have a network of over 130 local mines um, across England. Um, they are all independent charities, um, but deliver services in the heart of the community, ranging from peer support, so where people use their own experiences to support one another, sports, arts therapy, information services, talk services, counselling, really varied across the country. So if you're not engaged with your local mine, Certainly worth um, uh, this presentation. Have, having a look at where they are and, and um, making instructions to them if you're interested in working with them further. Um, so why am I so interested in, in all of this? Um, I've worked <coughs> in uh, physical activity uh, for the last 16 years. Um, background in inclusion, 
um, I have my own mental health problems. So um, since since a teenager, um, I've struggled with anxiety and depression, and um, sort of been through a lot of support. I have taken medication. I um, have talking therapy. Um, and for me, physical activity is something that's really helped me to manage my own mental health. Um, also, I, I have really close experience through um, friends and, and, and very close family members. So, family members, uh, close family members with diagnosis of bipolar, with schizophrenia, um, and supporting uh, supporting them and seeing how uh, their mental health problems sort of impacted on themselves, but also the family. So, supporting when they're well and they're unwell. So, I've kind of seen it from, from both sides, um, as well as being a volunteer for Deadly Mind uh, and leading uh, a running group. So, I'm a runner um, for Jolly Jogger. So, hopefully, some of that um, personal experience as well will be useful during this, this presentation. Okay. Oh. Okay, so why are we working together at Mind and Swim England? So many of you might be aware, um, I'm just going to keep it light, that um, mental wellbeing is one of the defined outcomes for the Department for Culture, Media and Sport and the Sport England strategy. And that was a groundbreaking moment really in uh, 2015 when mental wellbeing was really recognised as, as being something that physical activity has, has a real impact on. Um, traditionally, people think about getting active for their physical health or their waistline. But actually, you know, it makes us feel better too and can help us manage um, stress and help us uh, sleep better. Um, so this is a really important moment for us and a real sort of time. My mom has been doing some work in this space um, around getting people active for their mental health and some research into elite sport. And, and since this time we've started working with many more sports organisations to really understand how physical activity helps uh, people's mental mental wellbeing. So at my got a really clear vision that we believe it it should be used to build resilience. So being active can actually reduce your risk of depression by up to 30%. So I think that, that's, that's huge. But it can also help you when you're unwell um, on that road to recovery, as well as tackling the stigma, particularly by seeing um, uh, people talking out about their mental health, whether they're sports stars and celebrities or general public like you and I talking about mental health. It just makes it okay not to be okay. Um, and we've got a big network has as have uh, from England, and I think it's a really good thing to do that we can we can work together. Okay. So let's let's look at what is mental health and mental well-being. So it's just really going to reiterate um, that this is not a replacement for going on a course such as um, there's, there's lots of courses out there. There's mental health first aid. At Mind, we run a mental health awareness for sport and physical activity training course. Early in the new year, uh, we will be um, rolling an online uh, e-learning course. So this isn't a replacement. Um, we're not looking to make you an expert in this time at all, but it's just to, to increase your awareness and hopefully give you a flavour of, of the topic. Okay. So um, definition of mental health that we're going to use for this presentation uh, is the World Health Organization's definition. So it's defined as a state of well-being in which every individual realises his or own, her own potential, I think that's key, can cope with the normal stresses of life, work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make a contribution to his or her uh, community. So it really is that spectrum from uh, positive mental health to mental illness or being mentally unwell. So we all have mental health, um, just like we have, all have physical health. health. Some of us sometimes have mental health problems and we will move up and down that spectrum. You know, and that can change sometimes minute to minute, hour to hour, but week to week and year to year. Um, so I think it's important to recognise it's something that we all have and I think as a society we've all started to, to talk about a little bit more. I did just see a, a question in that chat box and I think you've been reading my notes because I was just going to ask you or just to take a moment to think if this is what mental health is then what is mental well-being? How would you define it? What's mental well-being? If you could just write your answers in your, your chat box and I'll just give you a moment to have a think about that. And hopefully I'll get some engagement that you're all still there because um, it really um, isn't great for my anxiety when I think I'm talking to myself. So brilliant, taking the time to look after yourself, yeah? Looking after your well-being, fantastic. Anyone else? 
prioritizing your own needs. I think that's very important and something that often many of us struggle with. Yep. Talking about your feelings, fantastic. Any Ailey, can I just jump in there a second? Because I've had a couple come directly to me. So okay. if you if you put a response um, and it goes directly to Learn to Swim. Can you put it either so everybody can see it or so Hayley can see it, not so that Learn to Swim can see it? <laughs> Thank you. It's quite a technical error there. I think we're all um, getting used to this new technology. Um, fantastic. Okay, so some really good stuff there. Um, and it is this. It's about your sleep, yeah. It's it's more of a holistic view. And sometimes these uh, terms are used interchangeably. So it's mental wellbeing. Coping with life, fantastic there, Beck. It is about this wider set of feelings, thoughts, and emotions that influence our day-to-day -day behaviour. It's about all of these things, about our wider health and well-being, around being confident and valuing it, accepting ourselves, um, really judging yourself on realistic and reasonable standards. And I think, I think that can be quite a challenge for lots of people. That we'd be very kind to a friend or to a colleague, um, but have probably really hard expectations of ourselves. Um, around our emotions, so a few people said on the chat box around feelings, uh, and it is a broad range of, of emotions and feelings. So sometimes when we ask this question, people will say, it's about being happy. Well, it's about being happy, sad, um, disappointed, uh, ecstatic, a little bit bored. It's about all of those emotions, about feeling them, understanding them, and expressing them. And importantly, it's around our, our relationships as well, and about being able to maintain and um, uh, positively build on relationships with people around us, as well as the work, life, our wider health determinants, the things, things like our eating, our sleeping, all of those things. So it's just a broader definition. Um, and I think it's really important that we, we look at the, the, the two definitions because they are often used interchangeably, and it is really important. Um, that we we do really sort of take the time to look after ourselves, and look, we take our uh, mental health and well-being uh, and treat it in the same regard as our as our physical health and well-being too. And they pass on one another. Okay. So we've what mental health is. We've talked a little bit about mental well-being. So what are mental health problems? So mental health problems affect the way we think, feel. And can happen to absolutely anyone, any of us, at any time uh, in our lives. Um, sometimes as uh, a result of, of a, a situation or a crisis, or sometimes for absolutely no particular reason, they, they just simply happen. Um, and they, they, they also have this, this range, so from mild, moderate, through to um, severe and long. And even within each diagnosis, um, there's that, that um, spectrum as well. So it is really, really complicated um, as well. So when we talk about common mental health problems, we're talking about things like anxiety and depression, and less common things like bipolar disorder, eating disorders, schizophrenia, psychosis. Now, I'm aware those are, those are big labels, and sadly, we don't have um, time to go into every single one of them today, but we will try to issue to you lots of information on our website as well and um, uh, video links. Uh, as well. So, mental health problems um, is when things um, happen over a period of time. So, we, sometimes we have this vocabulary where people will say, um, oh, um, you know, something's happened but with my boyfriend or something, or I'm feeling a bit depressed. Maybe they're just having a bad day or two, but it's when bad days turn into bad weeks and months. So mental health problems are normally diagnosed after a period of at least two weeks or more. Often doctors will um, ask you to come back and they'll do what they call active monitoring, that they're sort of checking in how you are during that time period. Um, so this language of, of mental health can be helpful, but also it can sometimes downplay actually how someone's feeling as well. So if mental health problems um, affect how we think, feel or behave, how might someone behave in a swimming setting if they're struggling with their mental health? So just want to pop in the chat box any any thoughts. What what behaviours might you see if someone that you are working with um is, is starting to struggle with their, their mental health? What might you notice?
and we saw a predictable change in attitude, appearance, acting out of character. Don't come in at all. Yep, yeah, they just disappear. Yep, yeah, they're, they're short tempered. The body language. Yep, yeah, low opinion. Flapping. Sounds like you guys have got quite a lot of experience of this. Um, fantastic. Not not turning up. Not engaging. Yeah, so there's a change, a change in their usual behaviour. So mental health problems are where you, uh, affect the way you think, feel and behave. Obviously, it can be very hard to see how someone's feeling and uh, think it, but what you do notice is those behaviours. So here, here are just a few of the, the common ones, and I think you've covered um, most of those um, already. Things like neglecting self-care. Um, changes in the, the work output or motivation. So I know I'm aware you're probably all coming from different spectrums of uh, learn to swim from um, different ages and um, different different levels of ability you're working with. But when you're starting to see sort of that change in performance as well, um, the physical appearance, um, perhaps with more so with adults, the changing in habit um, and colleagues that you work with as well. So perhaps you know. Um, Eating too much, too little, smoking more than they used to, going out for, you know, having to have a drink at the end of the day, and lots of cooks. Um, might also, also want to talk to you and how, how they're feeling as well. I think it is really important, though, that we don't make assumptions. You know, anything could have happened, could have had a bad day, uh, they could have overslept as I did this morning, so I'm looking a little bit dishevelled today. Um, Things sometimes just happen as well. So I think it's important as, as coaches and instructors, we get to know the people that we're working with and our, and our colleagues and spot what's what's different, so what's out of ordinary uh, with their, their behaviour. So it's about not making assumptions and really sort of it being okay to have a conversation with someone about how they're feeling. Okay, so I want to just play a quick game of um, true or false. I'll read out a statement. I'll say it twice. And then if you could just pop in the chat box, uh, I mean, you can just do a T for true and an F for false. Um, again, just to sort of see, challenge some of those perceptions and misconceptions. Okay, so we'll start with, uh, start with a statistic. Uh, so one out of 10 people will experience a mental health problem in any one year. I'll say that again. One out of ten people will experience a mental health problem in any one year. Oh, mixed bag there. True, true, false, 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 true, false. Any more? Fantastic. Okay, so it is in fact false. It's much higher than that. So uh, the statistics from the Adult Psychiatry Morbidity Survey. Um, don't worry, you don't have to remember that bit. It's actually one in four adults. Well, let's say it's a mental health problem in any one year. One in four. So, you know, that's that's quite a huge statistic. Thinking that the number of us um, on this call, and I'm not asking you to disclose um, if you do have mental health problems or not. Um, so that that that's a significant number. And in fact, one in ten young people um, experience mental health problems. So if you think about a class of thirty, you know, uh, that could be three young people. Um, at one at one time. Okay, let's do a couple more. Uh, I feel confident talking to someone about their mental health. I feel co confident talking to someone about their mental health. Yeah. True, true. Okay, so there's a mixed picture there. Of trues and false, there's no right or wrong with this one. Actually, that's, that's a bit of a, a a trick answer, a trick question. But we know that many people feel apprehensive about talking about mental health, um, and what we want to do is help you to become a little bit more confident to have that conversation, um, just as you would with physical health. If you if you notice someone was um, uh, looking physically unwell, or maybe they're under the weather with a cold, or got carrying a physical injury, you might ask them how how they're doing. Um, and you wouldn't be expected to become a physio overnight or a brain surgeon or a headache or something. Um, so we want to treat mental health in the same regard, but we know lots of people get really concerned that they're going to say or do the wrong thing. We've just launched a campaign with our colleagues at Time to Change, which is a campaign led by Mind and Rethink called Ask Twice. 
because I think as um, Brits, we are preconditioned that we ask the question, are you okay? Or how, how are you? And we there's one answer that we only ever give, and it's fine. Um, I think for most people, we say, yep, fine. Um, actually, if you ask them again, you say, no, really, are you okay? You might get the honest answer. So there's actually quite a, a cam campaign about this at the moment. Okay, so we'll do a couple more. People with mental health problems are dangerous. People with mental health problems are dangerous. False, 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 false. If we're in a room, I'd get you to move around the room, but obviously I can't see you, so uh, not, not all. Okay. Can be to themselves. Some really good points raised there. And ideally, I'd, I'd create a little bit of debate with this, this question. And it, it, it's correct, false. Um, having a mental health problem does not make you uh, um, dangerous. Despite how the media sometimes in the past has portrayed mental health problems, uh, the most common mental health problems have no link to violent behaviour whatsoever. Actually, people with serious mental health problems are more likely to be the victim of uh, violence or more likely to hurt themselves than, than anyone else. Um, so we're thinking here about things like self-harm or, or suicide. So I think um, the world has moved a lot in the last in the last few years in particular. Um, but we still sometimes see those those um those headlines, particularly on the tabloids, when, when something tragic happens um um and the person happens to have a mental health problem. And that can sort of instill a lot of fear around people. So it's it's really important that we, we raise awareness um, and actually people are more likely to hurt themselves than, than someone else. Okay, let's just do uh one more. Okay, I'll do another statistic. So, one in five visits to the GP are mental health related. One in five visits to the GP are mental health related. True, false, false, true, true. Oh, it's a real mixed bag, this one. Okay, really mixed bag. So it is actually false. It's higher than that. So uh, one in three visits to the GP are mental health related. One in three visits mental health related. And I think that's really interesting because quite often what we see is people will go to the GP perhaps with some physical health complaints. And um, sometimes uh, it might be around, it might be around chest pains, or it might be. Um, uh, tummy troubles or quite the neck and shoulder ache and actually when the, the GP sort of gets down to the, the root of the, the problem it can in fact be a mental, mental health problem so um, this is one of the things that we campaign around uh, mine quite heavily um, particularly because um, um, mental health services are underfunded compared to physical health services and it's sort of the, the growing crisis so it's something that we again, it's important to, to raise awareness of. Okay, so you'll be pleased now. You, you get a break from having to um, take part for a while. Um, I just wanted to share a few statistics here. So um, these are a few that we talked about already. Um, I just want to talk about a couple more. Um, sadly, every two hours, someone in England and Wales took their own life in in 2016. Um, so we know there's over 6,000 suicides every year, 75% of those are male. Um, so that's why it's so important that we all start talking about mental health and making it okay, not to be okay, and to have that, that conversation. Um, and the second one I really want to draw your attention to is just below the number of um, antidepressants um, issued every year. So mental health problems are treated in lots of different ways. Um, medication is, is really important. Um, for lots and lots of people and can be life-saving and I found actually for me when I, I was on medication it was life-saving um, but one of the things we see there so that's over a million prescriptions every single week that, that's very very high um, and also we know that um, physical activity for some people can be as effective as antidepressants particularly for mild moderate depression so it's something that we raise awareness and we, it's, very, it's very important that we, we understand um, it doesn't solve it for everyone. We can't just go for a swim or go for a run that's going to make our lives better, go away. But equally, um, 
understanding that medication is, is important for lots of people and it also has lots of um, side effects as well. Um, a couple of other stats I just really wanted to share with you. I know some of you will be working with young people. Um, so 50% of common mental health problems, so we're talking there about anxiety and depression in particular, are its first experienced by the age of 14. 50%. So there's a big spotlight on this at the moment and around training in, in schools in particular around, around mental health and sort of mental health literacy and vocabulary as well. And sort of many of the young people we work with um, are far more switched on to talking about how they're feeling um, than um, adults. So 50% are common mental health problems by the age of 14, 75% are experienced by the age of 24 as well. So often when people look back on their, of their, their growing up, they, they then identify issues when, when they were younger. So addressing it early, I think, is, is really, really important. So as I mentioned, we don't have time to go into every um, mental health problem in detail here. And I think it's really important that there's so much overlap and it's so complicated. We don't need to be experts in the labels anyway. Um, but when we send this around, um, here's the, the, the link to our website where you can access lots of um, information and you can hear people's stories firsthand. I think there's nothing more valuable than, than hearing from someone that's, that's been through it themselves. But we're just going to cover a couple of the common mental health problems now. Um, so um, looking at anxiety, it is something we all experience from time to time and it can be really helpful and um, if you're preparing for an exam or driving test or um, getting married or something, um, those nervous feelings, the butterflies in your tummy, um, and the adrenaline can be can be quite normal and quite useful. However, yes. when, no, that's that, when that's every day and it becomes overwhelming, and as we think about that definition, it starts to affect our day to day life. That is when it becomes a problem. So, common physical sen sensations um, can mean things like nausea, tummy troubles, um, tense muscles and headaches, breathing, that churning pit in your stomach. Um, and it can also lead to panic attacks or anxiety attacks as well. So making people feel like they're losing control, that maybe they can't feel their limbs or they're going to faint or have a heart attack or they start hyperventilating. So panic attacks are, can be experienced quite differently um, by different people. Um, psychological feelings, that feeling of uh, feeling really tense or on edge, really sort of feeling the worst, your mind just feeling quite overwhelmed and sort of thoughts, you know, something happens and you can't let it go, you ruminate over it again and again, dwelling on, on things, not being able to sort of rest or concentrate. So, you know, we all sometimes experience some of those things, so you're probably sitting there thinking, oh, that happens to me, but really think back to that definition, if it's, if it's affecting our day-to-day -day life, um, then, then that's when it becomes can become a problem. And of course, when you say so, so different um, as well, so remembering that. Oh, sorry, I skipped a slide there. So what causes anxiety can be something um, from, from our past or childhood, um, everyday life and habits, so exhaustion, stress, things that we, you know, sometimes we all experience long working hours, pressures, debt, money worries, all of those things can, can have an um, impact, along with things like our diet. So, um, Certainly things like caffeine is, is highly associated with anxiety and, and too much caffeine, eating lots of sugar, uh, the impact of our, our diet, our physical health. So if you have a long term health condition or um, a disability, but also um, chronic pain can, can make a real um, impact and, and really sort of really become quite draining and wear people down, as well as drugs or medication um, side effects. Um, certainly things like steroids or anti-medication oh. um, can be associated with anxiety. Alcohol, street drugs, genetics, so many, so many things. And it, it, it's, as I say, a very complicated um, picture. Autism, yeah, can really impact um, anxiety. So in terms of self-management and treatment, um, there's lots of things that we can encourage people to do to, to look after themselves and I think understanding what you're going through and how you're feeling is, is incredibly important. Um, so talking, you know, we, we do say it is good to, good to talk and often all, all people want is someone to, to, to listen um, 
and as I say, sort of to re re emphasize again, signpost on to, to somewhere um to support. Um also thinking about physical exercises, obviously something we're all hopefully quite passionate about, getting people active can really help. We just don't want that ever to become a burden in itself. So getting that balance I think is is, is key. And doing things that things that you enjoy um as well. As well as um, obviously here we've got some of the, the treatments, the self-help resources, medication, talking treatments, so things like meditation uh, and mindfulness can be, can be key. Oh. So we're just going to quickly look at depression. Uh, again, this language of um, uh, mental health. So people often say they're depressed when perhaps they're just a bit sad or miserable, or have, a, have a bad day. But certainly depression varies so much from from people to people, person to person, and can appear for no reason. So, you know, people talk about that there's a great animation by the World Health Organization about the black dog. Um, if you haven't seen it, I definitely urge you to, to go and have a look about um, the black dog that comes and, you know, it's about learning to, to, to tame that, that, those feelings. Um, sometimes it's about being, if people feel no lack of energy or motivation. Some people are really tearful. For, some people feel really sad and miserable. Some people just don't feel anything at all. So I think it's it can be really hard if you. Um, I would definitely urge to to watch something like World Health Organization um, animation or have a look at some of the films from people describing their own depression um, on on our website. So physical sensations, it can be really varied. So sleeping too much or too little, feeling very tired or having no energy. Again, appetite can be too much or too little, depending. You know, some people in the um, run for the biscuit tin or the um, uh, the chocolates, and other people just can't bear eating at all. So it, it really varies. Aches and pains are very common as well, along with um, coping strategies that aren't so um, healthy. So tobacco, alcohol, drugs, overworking, and many other things people can do. To, um, to sort of manage some of their, their symptoms that come out. Oh, sorry. So physical, um, so feelings, again, um, really depends. Everyone's very, very different, and that's why it's very, very hard when we talk about mental health and labels. We don't want to put people in boxes or to, to medicalise it too much. It's very hard even for the professionals often to diagnose people as well. So certainly in a 90 minute webinar, we're not going to be able to, to diagnose people at all. We don't want to be, um, but it's just giving us an awareness. So I think I think one of the key things on this is losing pleasure in things that somebody usually enjoys, um, whatever that might be. And you know, this sometimes plays out in a physical activity context, but everything is just sort of too much. And if swimming was the thing that the person enjoyed before and just getting nothing out of it, that can often be a, a huge um, indicator that someone is, is perhaps experiencing um, uh, depression. Okay, so in terms of behaviours, we, we talked about some of them earlier, but doing those things that they enjoyed, cutting themselves off, so becoming socially isolated, just not wanting to be around people. Um, uh, Self-harming can sometimes be an issue for some people, and that can vary in, in the, um, the way. Um, I don't want to talk about methods, but what I would say is that some people use um, uh, things like over-exercising or overworking um, as, as a way of self-harm, not sleeping um, as well. So there's, there's lots of other things um, outside of traditional um, Automatic things that you would think of, and people find it just find it difficult to to, to speak um, and be very withdrawn. And concentration, <coughs> in a swimming environment or a, a learning environment, and um, that you're often working in, you know, we you're asking your your learners, your participants, to to remember quite a lot. So it's another demand of, of something for them to think about, and you know, they find it hard to concentrate, make decisions. Um, it could be part of their, their mental health problems as well. Confidence and self-esteem um, often um, lowered or non-existent um, and not being kind to themselves. Just remembering back to judging yourself on re reasonable and realistic standards. Well, if you're feeling like this, then often um, you know, you're not doing that at all. Okay. 
So it can be really difficult and for some people they may be thinking about um, uh, harming themselves and thinking about, about suicide as well. And I think it's important, um, obviously, you know, we only have a short time together, but just to say if ever you are concerned about somebody um, in relation to you think they're going to hurt themselves, it is okay to ask that question um, and having been on the other side, both sides, um, uh, by asking someone, you know, if, if someone gives you cause for concern, things that they've said, if by asking that question you're not going to plant that seed in their, their head. So say, I'm, I'm really worried about you um, because you said this, um, are you thinking of hurting yourself? It's not going to make them go from being okay to thinking about doing something. So it's just having that conversation and it can be a very com difficult conversation to have, I know, but you definitely won't be planting any seeds. And you could just give the, somebody the opening to talk about how they're feeling. So I think that's that's really um, important. And I'm happy to stay on, ask for the call as well if anyone wants to speak to me, or ask me any questions individually, that is completely fine. So what that to help us the problem is when it affects day-to-day -day life, our relationships, our ability to live and work productively and to seek help and support. So it's really important that we, we talk about this because one in four of us may struggle with our mental health each each year. So there's lots and lots of labels. Um, you don't need to be an expert in all of them. Okay, um, um, I think what is important is having an awareness. Um, do you go on our website and have a read or come on a, a training course to, to find out more where we can have proper discussion um, around them. Um, but just also, people don't fit neatly into boxes in life, and it's, there's a lot of um, misdiagnosis anyway. Um, and the same with physical health. Like, do you know about every single physical health condition that somebody may have in your session? I, I, as a coach and instructor of many years, I'm pretty sure you don't. What the question that we should be asking is, how how can I help you, and how does this affect your swimming or, or swimming, whatever the, the case may be? So um, I just sort of urge don't get hung up on labels, um, but having an awareness is, is always um, useful. Okay, so we just want to unpick this, um, these words sort of stigma and discrimination. So, um, so stigma is used quite a lot in a mental health context because if we think back um, over the last sort of century, Haley's history lesson here, you know, um, people for, for many years, if, if they were struggling with their mental health, Years ago, were thought of as witches, um, or were put into psychiatric hospitals and units and locked away from society. And the world has changed, and understanding has has grown. But there's still been incidences, particularly in the media. People are very fearful, often, of of some of these labels, um, and because they don't understand. So we we talk a lot about stigma in in mental health, and it's definitely reducing. We see that um, all of the time. But in terms of a definition, so stigma is really about when we make assumptions about how a mental health problem will affect someone's behaviour. So perhaps you're receiving some application forms for your new intake and you read on it that somebody has um, an eating disorder or perhaps had self-harm uh, in the past. And you might think, oh, goodness me, what am I going to do? And we start making lots of assumptions or start making assumptions about what that self harm might look like and present and actually you meet the person and it's very different um, so that's what we mean by stigma and, and you know that that happens in all walks of um, society so people can sometimes can be concerned that the person's different dangerous or, or strange okay when we talk about discrimination that is mean that is when we act on it so it's when we treat someone differently because of their mental health that could be consciously or subconsciously. So it might mean um, it's extreme. Um, we get an application form from a volunteer or another instructor who has schizophrenia, bipolar, psychosis, let's say, something like that. And we go, oh, I'm not sure. I don't think they can be a volunteer. And actually, we're not going to put forward their application based on that decision. And I'm sure that's never going to happen. And that's quite an extreme. Uh, and certainly I know lots of people with bipolar schizophrenia that, that work and do work in the sports sector as well. Um, <coughs> that, that would just be an example of discrimination. 
Okay, so we just wanted to sort of explain it so we can, um, it's something we fight against, particularly in a mental health context. But just to bring this sort of cycle of stigma to life, so this is uh, from Time to Change, so our big campaign has been running for over 10 years with Rethink Mental Illness, so two huge mental health charities work together on this. Um, and just to bring it to life really, um, if, if it's okay, I will use my own example. Um, so when I was, um, well, uh, I think years ago, um, and uh, I was really, you know, I didn't tell anyone, didn't want to tell work, didn't even want to tell my family, my husband, because my job was to support everyone else, that's what I did. But I was really, really poorly. So I was scared to reveal the problem. I really fought off getting any help for a long time. There's lots of silence around the issue. So there's a lot of lack of knowledge. And that impact is, you know, not just on me, you know, I was contributing to that, um, you know, that, that stigma really, because I had a lot of self stigma. Um, so, you know, in, in turn, that means people are scared to raise the issue and there's more silence. And so it kind of goes on and on and on. However, um, I did around the same time actually, um, take the, the job um, for, for mine not long after and started getting involved in, in time to change. So the first Thursday of every February is time to talk day. So it's Thursday the 7th of Feb uh, 2019. And I got involved a few years ago um, uh, with time to change. So um, over the years, we've done all sorts of things like giving out tea bags with it's okay to talk, it's time to talk. Um, and I actually went on to my local park run with some of my uh, running friends. And we had our time to talk t-shirts on, it's okay to talk. We were giving out sort of literature. And um, all of a sudden, we were sort of starting to really break down that stigma because um, when we started talking about it, other people would come up and say, oh, you know what, I've been struggling myself, or um, my mum has, or my sister, or and, and it just made it okay not to be okay. So it is a cycle of stigma, but it is also something that we can um, break as well. Just to say if anyone uh, is on the call that has been struggling with their mental health, it can be really hard to, to have that conversation for the first time. Um, and I'm not saying here that you have to go away and start becoming a mental health advocate at all. Um, but certainly there's, there's lots of people and support out there if, if you did. And actually, it's really quite empowering um, when you do share your story. And also quite humbling when other people come and uh, talk to you as well. Okay. So that's stigma, so hopefully we have um, addressed it and we're, you're all here today, so we're helping to break it down. We're going to, to talk about um, the five ways to wellbeing. Um, can anyone just pop in the chat box if they've seen this before, just a yes, no, any kind of feedback. Just check you're still there, really. No, no, you sort of, okay, just always you sort of get a feel for where we're at. Um, I know everyone's understanding is very, very different. Okay, so um, just to give you kind of a lowdown, um, we don't want to get too scientific today, but the New Economics Foundation are a, sort of a research organisation, and they did a huge piece of research into all the ways that people can look after their, their mental wellbeing, so in that broad definition. Um, and they analysed them, and they basically um, brought them into these, these five themes. Um, there are hundreds of ways, and everyone's so different, but these five themes um, sort of summarise them really nicely. So I'll just take you through them quickly. So connecting with people. So um, I guess I would always say we work with, we are pack animals as humans, that actually if you've been having a bad day, lots of people would like to get on the phone or go and have a chat with their, maybe, maybe their mum or their partner or someone that they trust. That connecting with people is actually really good. It's proven to be good for our mental wellbeing. Um, that being around people, with people, sharing, um, is can, can strengthen mental well-being. Sometimes, we carry out to that, is if you're around people all day, um, sometimes what you need to do for your mental well-being is disconnect and, and have some time on your own. Um, but it is one of the, the strongest ways of supporting well-being. And what we found for our own work at MIND, particularly um, the sports program that I uh, lead on, Get Set to Go, about getting people active for their mental health. The physical activity was important, but the connecting with other people, statistically, we did some huge research, had a, gr a really great greater impact on people's mental well-being. So, 
at the end of each session or most of the sessions we would organize some kind of social activity encourage people to get to know one another over a cup of tea and toast and it was being with people had a massive impact on their, their physical um, and their, their mental health so connect is one be active which we're gonna we talk about throughout this presentation but Reduces our risk of depression, helps us feel better, whatever whatever it is, whether it's getting off the bus or stop earlier, um, raises those and sort of things is, is key. Take notice. So we talk a lot um, at the moment, uh, mindfulness is, is incredibly um, uh, topical and I think it's something that's proven to be incredibly important for our mental well-being. Um, so through taking notice, that's like being aware of where, of where we are, um, right now and being in the moment as such so it can be around things like uh, breathing techniques so um, uh, there's, there's a fantastic app called Headspace that is one of many uh, that I can recommend which really helps around meditation really short guided about your, your breathing and taking notice of how you're feeling because we're all so busy running around the world right now that we often forget to do that equally it could be having a nice cup of coffee with no other, no, no telly, no, you know, no being distracted and just savouring the moment or noticing the, uh, the change in the season. So taking notice of being in, the, taking some time but for now of how you're feeling and the world around you is key. So keep learning. Um, so we're not saying everyone has to go back to school, um, but that feeling of setting a goal and working towards it and achieving it is proven to, to strengthen our well-being. So the example of whether it's doing the crossword and that, that little feel-good feeling that you get when you've achieved it um, through to mastering a new stroke or um, learning on a, on a course. And, yeah, yeah, I've, I've done that. Actually proven to help our well-being. And the final one, give. So, you know, this is where if I was in the room with you, I would say uh, this isn't about giving £5 a mind, although that's very nice if you do charitable acts of donation does generally feel better when you do it um, I'm not asking for your money here um, but giving your time your energy your, your talents saying thank you to someone that doesn't normally get thanked or giving someone a compliment um, those, those really small things if you think about last time you did any of those things giving money volunteering for the day noticing something no one normally notices so like for me Speaking to the, the cleaner and sort of, you know, always someone I think cleaners get undervalued and then think afterwards, oh yeah, I felt good for that, like, that is that feeling. So giving your, your time, your energy, your, your talent and giving a compliment, all of those things um, and uh, impact on your mental well-being. And they all connect as well. So in the swimming environment, I guess it's, it's about thinking about how you can bring some of those in. You, you do lots of goal settings already with your... Um, your learners, whoever they are, whatever age, ability, um, thinking about how they can support one another and give each other maybe feedback or compliments. Um, think about how they can take notice of their, their progress and again, progress of others um, and connect in. So I'm sure you do lots of like key energizers during your sort of your warm ups, but sort of really encouraging that, um, that bond and connection with one another. So um, it is about the small things. You, you don't need to be an expert. Everyone's diagnosis um, of uh, a mental health problem will be different anyway. We all experience things different, differently. It's about not being afraid um, and listening and taking time and being patient. So as I say, you know that thinking about that parity of esteem, as we call it, the so treating mental health and physical health the same. Um, that we're not an expert in everything, but often we would just we'd listen to someone if they'd said that they were going through a tough time because of, of physical illness, and we would kind of reassure them. And hopefully, if they hadn't been to the doctors, we'd find post them there, and it's exactly the same. Okay, so we're just going to look now um, at this link between physical and mental health, um, and physical activity and mental health. Um, we kind of touched on it already um, quite briefly. So um, I'm not going to spend too long, but just to say uh, physical activity is so good for us that it should actually be one of the first things that doctors recommend to us when we present at the doctor, particularly with mild moderate depression. So hopefully every GP is different and um, there's actually a whole piece of um, 
uh, there's a new resource launching for GPs and professionals in the next couple of weeks to help them to do this. But prescribing physical activity should be one of the first things they do, along with other things like medication and talking therapies. So it helps improve our mood, endorphins, and it helps us to reduce stress. So our cortisol levels, by being physically uh, active, whatever that sport may be, it, it helps us to get a better balance of, of the stress hormone cortisol helps our serotonin levels and helps us sleep, dopamine, so all these things happen uh, automatically when, when we're active. <coughs> Bless you, whatever that was, and lifts um, um, our self-esteem as well. But also, it's about the, the softer things, it's about the achievement, the new skills, the having fun, and I think that, again, the research we did with Loughborough University came back um, that it's really important to build what they call in, is um, intrinsic motivation. So doing something because you value it, you enjoy it, is incredibly important and it strengthens again your mental well-being. So if you make it fun, you make people see how they're progressing, um, that really helps at their mental well-being rather than feeling like you've got to do it because you're feeling guilty or maybe in your environment sometimes people are there because they have to be. Um, so helping them to, to really understand why, why it's good for them. And yes, it's a life-saving skill, but also it can be something that can help them to unwind and make friends and be fun as well. So yeah, I'm all for bringing back the fun factor in any kind of physical activity. Okay, so it's especially important if you have a mental health problem, um, particularly if you have a uh, severe and enduring mental health problem, um, because you are twice as likely to die from heart disease, uh, four times as likely to die from respiratory disease and have a lower life expectancy. Now, there's lots of reasons um, behind this and it's a very complicated landscape, but often because of the um, um, comorbid other so sort of physical health conditions, the effects of medication, um, so it's coming on some very powerful um, drugs, things like uh, lithium, for example, is one of the, the treatments, can have quite... Um, quite large side effects, but also some of the less healthy coping strategies may not be so good at eating well. Um, so just saw a note from Kim about a TV a documentary about physical activity and mental health. There's been some great um, programmes, definitely. And I think I would always say um, it's about balance. Um, it's really important. And as the head of physical activity for mind, I have, feel I have the um, you know, of course, I'm and someone that's physically active and helps my mental well-being. It is really important, but it doesn't mean it fixes everyone and makes everything else go away. And sometimes, some of the um, some of the case studies um, um, and uh, some of the research would imply that if you're active, you can just get rid of all of those other things. And I think we just have to take quite a balanced view that um, some people will need talking therapy and some people will medication and. And, and that's okay too. So, um, yes, balance, I think, is, is definitely um, key. Um, but just to say, in terms of it being used as sort of a treatment, um, uh, particularly for mild moderate depression, so if you, you go to your doctor, mild moderate depression, it's, it's been proven to be effective as physical activity in sessions of 45 minutes to an hour, three times a week over a 10 to 14 week period. So, again, uh, just to sort of make you aware, three times a week, probably the kind of sessions that you're doing already. Um, so I think what we are starting to see now is more physical activity on prescription. And uh, I think that's something that we, we've certainly been lobbying for as it's part of the, the toolkit of support, shall we say. Okay. And there you go, I've just said that. So, Okay, so just to check you to the wake, um, what are the benefits of swimming on mental health? Aside from the ones I've already talked about, what, what else? How can swimming benefit somebody's mental health? I've given you quite a few clues over the last 10 minutes. Social life skills, stress release and relaxation, the floating in the water, yeah, completely. Incredibly calming, yeah, just being around water. Um, unless it's incredibly noisy pool and then I don't know, but for me I find that quite hard the acoustics, having to overcome a fear, building confidence, makes you happy, yeah, relaxation, weightless, 
definitely. And certainly, I think particularly um, when you're swimming and you're swimming strokes, you don't have time to think about that, uh, those worrying thoughts, because often if someone's focusing on sneak, for example, then um, um, they're, they're occupied and so they don't have time to, to think. But yeah, I think water, we know, is very common. Um, and certainly there is um, uh, open water swimming, sorry. Um, open water swimming as well, there's lots of research starting to come through around the benefits of their mental health, although it feels a bit cold to me, so I, yeah, I'm warm water swimming, definitely. Okay, so yeah, we talked about lots of these um, as well. I think, um, I think I've mentioned this already, but this better social provision, so being socially connected links to better mental well-being, and that in turn helps people be, feel like they can cope and helps around their resilience. Um, and that was one of our, our key, key findings. Also, um, certainly around loneliness and isolation, and certainly I know Swim England are doing lots around um, in the past around um, dementia, dementia friendly swimming and older people and people with long term health conditions. So, again, help people overcome those, those challenges as well because loneliness and isolation is, is almost like a silent killer and really affects people's mental and physical health. And these, Two things that are completely interlinked and affect one another. Okay, so but sometimes we need to be a bit cautious as well. So there's a thank you, Charlotte. So sometimes the accomplishments as well um, helps well-being. Yeah, definitely. And I think as a volunteer, I get as much pleasure out of um, seeing my my runners because I'm a run leader um, achieve, and that really strengthens my well-being as well by seeing them do well and achieve their goals, and I feel really proud of them. So definitely from both sides, as a participant and as a volunteer or a coach. Okay, so but sometimes we need to approach sport and um, physical activity with caution. Yeah, Kelly, uh, we said there about it. it helps you get away from um, reality for a while. Yes, completely. It's escapism, isn't it? Yeah completely agree. So it is really good for us, but sometimes we do need to approach it with caution. Um, and particularly in these um, situations. So um, again, we're not expecting you to be an expert or to start saying, no, you can't take part. But again, just having an awareness um, that over-exercising is, is, is a challenge for, for some people. So particularly if someone has uh, eating problems or you suspect has probably got a bit of a problem with food, uh, people can use it to compensate for those calories. So um, in its extreme level, um, when people are really unwell with eating, eating problems, you know, certainly no of stories of people that would be marching around their room or doing even in the hospital environment, trying to burn off as many calories as they can. So if if you know someone in your group has an eating problem, I'm sure if it's sort of a moderate activity, it's fine. But having that conversation with the, the individual or, or parents, if somebody was so poorly, um, then that conversation would have taken place already. Someone would have talked to you about this, about their um, level of physical activity. Thinking at a performance end, keeping an eye if someone's overtraining, um, and you're noticing um, it's starting to affect them. And if you think someone's overtraining or doing too much, again, you would you would have that conversation. Again, because it affects their physical health and their performance. Um, so people that have compulsive or addictive feelings um, about exercise, the right thing you do need to take care of your own well-being. That is incredibly important. You need to um, give care to take care. Take care, take care to give care, sorry. Um, that, is, that is really important that we, we think about ourselves um, as well. Um, and it is okay to do that. Um, and if you do have to have some difficult conversations, um, making sure you've got someone that you can have a debrief with or there's some support, whether that's from your line manager or welfare lead or um, your employee, the assistant program, if you've got one, the counselling line, speaking to someone, according to the mind in pro line, you, you need to have a chat with something that's been a bit difficult. Um, so yeah, people who uh, sometimes can develop compulsive or addictive feelings about exercises, it, for some people they find it helps, and then they want to do it more and more and more. And again, we all know that that can affect their physical health as well, and injury and performance, as well as their, their mental health. And it can be used as self-harm. So again, you know, I don't want to scare any of you right now, but I think it's just having an awareness 
that sometimes there's a tipping point and certainly we've seen this in our programme with some people who were completely inactive, they found that physical activity really helped their mental wellbeing and then they got to the point where actually they were doing too much and, and we had to have conversations with them about um, having a, a balanced uh, life um, and making sure they take rest but also doing things at uh, different things so it might be having a going for a walk or doing stretching or something on those um, those lighter days as well. Um, people experiencing side effects of medication. Um, so um, medication for mental health um, can affect people in lots of different ways. Weight gain, um, so there is a, a link between many, but not all, of antidepressant medication and weight gain. People often um, put on at least, uh, I think the research says around 10 pounds. But again, that knock-on effect on self-esteem, particularly in a pool environment, thinking about what you're wearing. Um, uh, for some people around their hydration levels and energy levels, so lots of people find mornings very hard because of um, uh, the effects on sleep that their medication has. So if you're, for example, thinking about running a mental health um, specific session, so particularly targeting, you know, reaching out to people that are struggling with their mental health, you probably don't want to put that at eight or nine o'clock on a on a morning because people will find that often very very difficult to to get to. And again, um, people who experience anxiety or panic attacks. So particularly for um, if you are at like in a performance level or you're training very hard, that those feelings sometimes, or if you're doing a dry side session, so if you're working more at sort of that end where you're you're doing a mixture of dry side and then swimming. Um, those feelings that some people have around when they're having a panic attack or starting to have an, a panic attack, so sort of a feeling of um, hyperventilating and their breathing being affected, can sometimes be similar feelings to when you're working out quite hard. So it's about working with the individual if you know they have panic attacks. Now, just to say that it's really important, if somebody has a panic attack for the first time, don't make any assumptions because unless you know for sure they're in a panic attack, the feelings can be very much like somebody having a heart attack or having breathing difficulties or an asthma attack. So never, never make assumptions. Um, if you see someone that's, that is sort of hyperventilating, follow your first day training, get extra help, ring 999. Convert, if someone tells you they have anxiety attacks or panic attacks all of the time, ask, just ask them how, how you can support them um, during that, how they want your help. Um, often people will just need a little bit of time, last usually a matter of minutes, um, but just, yeah, just to caveat, please, please don't make assumptions. Um, uh, and again, we've got quite a lot of um, uh, resources online on our sports section of our website um, about this. So again, um, happy to take any, uh, have a look and then do get in touch with, with the questions. Okay. So moving on to just looking at some of the barriers. Um, so we know that physical activity can really help our mental health. Um, we also know there's lots of uh, barriers to, to getting started. We tend to group them thinking about uh, the physical environment, um, psychologically, sort of technical barriers. They're very much sort of related to the sport itself and then the sort of the social barriers. So I just want you to have a think. Um, to give you some examples there, so physical barriers, it could be about traveling to the venue or medication effects. Uh, psychological, it could be about being anxious in a new situation or difficulty sort of concentrating. Technical, might not know the specific te uh, technique. Or social, maybe it's around find it hard to make friends. So can you come up with any swimming related barriers? Pop them in the chat box. Fear of water, yeah, massive, age, yeah. body conscious fear, yeah. Not being comfortable with early morning practices, yeah. People seeing them, yeah, trauma. There are lots and lots of things. Lack of experience. So there are lots of um, barriers, and again, we will send the slides uh, round. 
um, and when we started on our sort of journey as uh, sports projects at the time, we, we talked to lots of people to really understand um, what was holding them back. And 70% of people told us that having a mental health problem made it more difficult to get started. Uh, over half said that they were not gym body ready um, because they're embarrassed about their body shape or size. Um, two thirds worried about going by themselves and not knowing anyone, and a third said that they they didn't want you guys or us, the sports sector, to know that they're struggling with their mental health. So, um, so there's lots and lots of things that, that come into play um, around how how people are feeling, feeling like they're not good enough to take part, um, having bad days, body image. I think is is key with swimming. I mean, I find. Uh, swimming can be quite, you know, makes you quite self-conscious. So, you know, and there's some really simple um, adaptations there in terms of, you know, allowing people to have their towels poolside and being flexible if the operator, pool operator, will let you with um, uh, the, the clothing that can be worn and, and things like that. But being sort of sensitive and so that people aren't um, uh, feeling uh, isolated as well. So there's, there's lots and lots of things, and some of these things. Um, I think it's really important that, that lots of people are experienced barriers to being physically active. Um, so whether you're working with women's groups, older people, people from ethnic minorities, everyone experiences some kind of barriers. And many of these you will have ways to overcome already. So knowing what to do when you arrive and the, the norms, like where to go, where the locker is, who's who. Swimming's hard. There's a lot of things you've got to do before you get poolside. Um, that's probably common to lots of people who might have something in place. I just want to stress that when you have a mental health problem, that these barriers can be really magnified. Um, so you feel them often more intensely for the effects of them. So that, like thinking back to what we said earlier about butterflies, we often all feel a bit nervous when we go somewhere. Um, I, I certainly know people that would go in and out of the session, in, in and out of the venue like 10 times or for weeks before actually turning up or people that would be literally physically sick on the, on the car park because they were so anxious. So just to sort of, um, uh, lots of the solutions, lots of the barriers and lots of the solutions might be the same. I think the intensity is just really important to emphasise can be much greater. Um, but also just to say, um, some of them, some of the barriers, um, very few are sort of just about mental health. So I think there's lots of things that you're probably doing already in your sessions that um, you're looking at that and thinking, oh, well, we, we, we have ways to mitigate that already um, that will just work um, as well. So, okay. And also say so other people will probably not tell you there's no barriers and there. You, you, if it affects one in four of us, adults and one in ten young people, you've got people in your session already. So, again, just to sort of reassure you there. So. The approach that we use, um, we worked with lots of people with mental health problems, with coaches, and we came up with um, CARE. So that's our inclusive coaching approach, and there's a link there to a neat little animation that we created with UK Coaching and Public Health England, um, which explains this um, probably more succinctly than, than I will. Um, but it comes down to these four things that you can do. Um, so. The C standing for uh, your coaching and customer skills. So really thinking about that experience that you can provide, um, acknowledging some of it is in your, inside your control and some some of it is out of your control. Just want to add that. That what the experience you provide before, during, and after a session. So making sure it's welcoming and people know where to go. Making it okay to talk about mental health as well as physical health. Um, Offering those alternatives, giving feedback, just giving a really good sort of coaching and customer experience, um, and having worked with lots of people and worked in inclusion um, previously. You know, I think it's, um, it's. I really believe that good coaches and good instructors kind of adapt to lots of people that they meet anyway. So just thinking about that before, during, and after. The A stands um, as awareness. So get to know your individuals, and I think certainly when you were giving feedback about the behaviours, that really indicated to me that you, as instructors, you you are really taking notice. And I think getting getting to know what's normal for somebody and your colleagues and your friends and your family, and then spotting when something is a bit different. So 
um, asking people how they're feeling, that paying attention to sort of the warning signs, using your observation skills, and importantly, not making assumptions and just saying, you know, I'm worried about you. How, how can I help? How can I support you? Because I think that's that's really key. Um, the R for respect, um, of course, you know, we want to treat everyone uh, fairly and, and kind of not single people out because of their, their mental health problems. Um, if possible, just making your, yourself available to, to, to listen to them, as I say, as you would with any physical health. And treating information where appropriate in confidence. And I say where appropriate um, in, in confidence because, of course, some information, if you're, you're worried about um, somebody harming themselves or other people, you will have safeguarding policies. And it's incredibly important that you do um, share that and you don't take on too much yourself. You are there as a coach or an instructor. So just want to sort of add that caveat there. Mm -hmm. And then around your empathy. Um, you're never going to know exactly how someone feels, so no two people with the same condition feel, uh, think and feel and behave the same. Um, but, uh, listen and, and try and under understand. And I think the key is not feeling pressure to, to fix somebody or find the answers. Um, you, you, you know, we're not mental health specialists, we're not psychiatrists, we're not there to fix them. You're there to coach them in their swimming ability. But just trying to signpost them to support and, and just treat them how you'd kind of want to be treated yourself if you wasn't if you wasn't feeling well. So yeah, definitely urge you to go and have a look at the um, the animation as well. But just think of those things. And I would say probably many of you have seen this already quite naturally. Um, you haven't got to go and lo make lots of um, expensive adaptations or do things wildly differently. It is about those softer those softer skills. Um, so you please know we're coming towards the end now. So um, just wanted to highlight um, some of our research that some of you might be interested in um, from um, uh, our work with Get Set to Go, which was our Sport England project with Loughborough University. And we've got a report on our website that you might want to to have a look at. Um, but two things I just really wanted to sort of a few things I really wanted to focus on. Um, these are the recommendations from the, the report. Um, and I'm sure these are the things that you, you try to do already, so around consistency, so the same place, same time, same coach, really helps people, um, particularly, I think it helps all of us in terms of um, our physical activity, but particularly um, if you're struggling with your, your mental health. We talked about autonomous motivation, so making it fun and enjoyable and people seeing value. Uh, where appropriate, including friends and family um, involved. And for us, something that's really important is um, lived experience of mental health problems um, and people helping one another where they can. So if, for example, you was looking to develop mental health swimming programs in partnership with organisations, um, then really listen to people who have been there um, and uh, been in the same boat really, really helps. Um, and thinking about those, those sort of barriers that we've talked about and how you can overcome them. Okay, there's a few more that came through um, around, um, for us, we did a lot where we, a lot of sort of sports projects to then help people get into mainstream sessions, so making things personalised and person-centred, and that may not be appropriate for you. But one thing we found that um, when people couldn't come along to their um, aqua swim session or their swimming session, that people, because they understood that being active actually helped them, they went out for a walk on those days instead. And actually came through really strongly. People really understood it helped their mental health and well-being. Um, but also around sort of linking up with the mental health sector. So as I said at the start, um, we have got local mind in your local area. They're great point point of information. There are also other mental health charities. Um, if you need support from them um, as well, or if you want to reach out to them to to get involved um, in activities. And also, you're here today, so you're you're here developing your knowledge of mental health, which is fantastic. Okay, so just want to come on to um, a case study. Um, so meet Sean and Lucy, and again, I can't show the video on the on the software. We have a link um, through to uh, a video, which you might want to go and have a look at. So Sean and Lucy um, are part of Deadly Mind. Uh, so Sean is a, a peer volunteer, and um, so. On the first picture, Sean is on the right, the first, um, uh, and uh, Lucy has the long blonde hair. 
Um, and they they worked together over a period of months. Um, so Lucy hadn't been active um, since she was actually at school. Um, and she she wanted to be you know, active for her mental health. She had uh, physical um, disability as well. And really lacked uh, confidence, had lots of social barriers, um, anxiety about being around other people, about going to the pool for the first time. And through the Get Set to Go programme, they buddied up in essence. Um, so Sean met met up with Lucy every week um, to support her to get active. So I think I said earlier, two thirds of people um, weren't active because they had no one to go with. Um, so this really helped her Lucy uh, to form a weekly habit. She's lost uh, weight, more confident. She's got a new hobby, and she's got something to talk to um, her friends and family about, which is which is, is incredibly important. Oh. It's improved her mental health and well-being because, again, she's got active at the same time, but also seeing Lucy progress has, has really, really helped. Now, I appreciate you can't necessarily all set up here um, uh, buddy programs at the the uh, pools that you're working in, but it's definitely something to think about um, going forward, how you can buddy people up to support one another. So if you've got somebody in your group who's particularly anxious or shy or withdrawn, is there somebody in that group that's more empathetic and understanding that you can can sort of buddy together to, to work with one, one another? Sort of another example um, in Hereford, uh, in Hereford Mind, uh, aqua aerobics was, was one of the most popular um, activities for a mainstream session that was already running. And Neil, one of our um, volunteers, um, had actually gone there independently, really seen the benefits. So you talked about. Um, the relaxation, sort of the buoyancy of the water, the calm on the mind, um, the being with other people, and and certainly, so he worked uh, with the instructor, delivered some awareness training, um, and uh, supported sort of local local people to to go along and take part in those sessions. So we've had people take part in swimming and aqua activities all the way from open water swimming. To, uh, last week, I think, was the big dip up north where lots of people took their clothes off and uh, got in the North Sea and did a swim for mind. People one to one, people in the groups. I think for me, something that is key is is that social um, support where where possible. So as we see there, um, Sean and uh, uh, Lucy are having a chat at the end. I'm pretty sure there's probably a cup of tea involved somewhere. Um, but really thinking about how we can sort of break down those barriers and thinking back to, to care, you know, customer skills and coaching skills, your awareness, respect and empathy. It's, it's not asking you to do anything uh, wildly, wildly different. And where there is a mental health programme, uh, such as uh, Get Set to Go or other programmes, then see how you can link in. You might be able to be the provider that's uh, running those sessions and it will help you to increase your awareness um, and um, understanding and also um, help the um, service users have a really positive experience. Okay, so before I finish, I just briefly want to highlight the support available both for yourself and for others. Um, so there's lots and lots of support out there and as we said throughout, taking care of yourself is, is important as well as uh, looking after the people that you, you work with. So um, at MIND, we have the information line um, that's available uh, Monday to Friday, uh, 9 till 6. Um, the details are here, and we'll send this round. You can also Hello. email them, You're right. You're right. access support via our uh, website. Um, you can also find local local MIND. So right. if you find a link, there is a, a map there. Our local MIND. Um, so. right, um, sorry. Did you ever mute themselves? Sorry, thank you. Um, and you can also find your local MIND. So you can uh, all in your, your local area. Um, we also have Any Friends. So Friends is an online um, community that anyone that's struggling with their mental health can join. So you have to be 18. But I say anyone, anyone over the 18. You need an email address, um, and uh, I think you put your date of birth in there just to check you're over 18. And people give and receive um, support. So if someone's struggling, it's a bit like Facebook. Um, it started uh, out of a campaign called the elephant in the room. So this concept that we don't talk about our mental health, it's a big taboo. 
Um, it grew that large. We were on Facebook that we were asked to set up our own website because um, it was that large. But we have themes on there, so people will sort of tag discussions, so a bit like a use a bit like a hashtag um, around sort of getting access and and to give support uh, to. This is why she emailed me about. And it's a great place to. Um, Wanting the email. Talk to other people that are struggling with their mental health. Sorry. Um, Lily has asked me about the certificate. Oh, we're just hearing this whole conversation. Ryan as well, and I've got can't do anything more about it. It's, um, it's, sorry. It's so that's right right can you um please, Eleanor? Can you please mute yourself? Sorry, we don't want to hear your conversation in the nicest possible way. Okay, so if someone's struggling in a crisis, um, of course. Uh, uh, if you need to signpost someone to support, signpost them sort of generally, if it's uh, to their GP. If they're in crisis, so by crisis we mean someone feels that their mental health is at a breaking point and you're really concerned that they're going to harm themselves or someone else, then treat it exactly the same as you would a physical health emergency. So signpost them um, to 999 But now this makes you wonder about can... where she was working previously, like, Sorry. Now, because yeah. Sorry guys, I'm just going to try and mute if I can find. Thanks guys, sorry about that. We uh, we didn't really need to hear that conversation. Um, so, um, <laughs> thanks Claire. Yeah, not great for my anxiety. Um, uh, but we're good, we're good. So, um, yeah, so if it was uh, an emergency, exactly the same as physical health, 999 A&E. Um, the Samaritans are also great. They're there to listen to anyone any time of day. Uh, children, young people, exactly the same. So what would you do if your child or young person in a session was struggling with their physical health? Presumably you talk to the parents when they pick them up and, and say you're worried and you think they, they need to go to the doctor. And I know this can be a really difficult conversation to have when we're talking about mental health, but in terms of treat, treating it the, the same um, and think back to your, many of you will have first aid training, what would you do with a first aid incident exactly the, the same, so particularly in a crisis situation. If you're just, if you're worried about someone day to day, um, if you're worried about someone on a day to day basis, um, they've, they've talked to you, they've said they're, they're feeling really low, they've been feeling like it for weeks, um, uh, then saying, you know, have you thought about going to your GP or what about getting in touch with someone like Mind or other mental health charities locally if, if appropriate. So there was a question there about other mental health charities. Um, so we do have a sort of a directory on, on our website um, and um, certainly there are lots of other uh, providers and charities who work very closely together. So Rethink uh, Mental Illness, Together UK, um, the mix is fantastic, so if you're working a lot with young people, children and young people, the mix um, is, is a great um, uh, website, but also they will do chat, uh, text chat lines for young people as well. So if you're working with teenagers, and maybe it's not appropriate, so appropriate to talk to their parents, you might say, have you heard of the mix, um, get, get involved. Um, well, I believe we've also got some of these contacts in the volunteer. I think there's a good volunteer guide or handbook, but I'll check in with the, the team um, about that and can certainly share uh, local links. But yeah, so just to recap there, if you're worried about someone in general, signpost them to their GP or to Mind or perhaps young people to, to the mix, I think would be a great, great place. If you think it's a crisis, you think they're going to hurt themselves or others, um, then treat it exactly the same as physical health, GP, um, sorry, 999 or A&E. Okay, and I've seen some questions, so I'll take those in just a minute if that's okay. Um, uh, so in terms of resources, um, resources are a click away. We've got lots available, um, uh, certainly on a sport out area of our website, as well as our information pages. Lots of people sharing their own personal stories. We've got also got video clips from coaches about the adaptations that they make and their experiences as well, which I think um, are really, really powerful. So, so certainly have a, have a look. We've got resources on safeguarding um, and top tips, etc. On, online. 
Um, and we also convene a mental health and sport network twice a year. So we move this around the country, so particularly aimed at uh, regional providers. Um, and we, we bring people together to sort of share and learn from one another and have guest speakers. So just to um, sort of start to close before I open up for questions, um, so no one expects you to be mental health experts at all. It's great you're here today raising your awareness. There is lots of local support available to you and national support too. We all have mental health, um, so don't be afraid to ask someone how they're feeling um, and maybe ask them twice if you think they're not looking like their usual selves. Um, remember, it's the simple things that count. So by that, I mean it's you know checking in with them the next week, particularly if you were worried about them and saying, oh, you know, you might open a conversation by saying something like, I've noticed you don't seem yourself, or and then next week checking in and say, how are you doing? How how things? Um, so it's those simple things um, uh, that count. And don't try and fix everyone. It's you're there as a coach or instructor. So remember, it's um, it's about the, the care um, acronym. Um, we've got lots more resources um, launching over the coming months. So I think I mentioned there will be an e-learning course that we haven't more detail be very interactive for you to complete either individually or in small groups um, as well as other training that's, that's out there as well and just to really say your own mental health is, is just as important you need to um, take care to give care um, so looking after yourself uh, is, is key so you have permission today to go and do something for yourself go and do something that you enjoy even if it's having that cup of tea with um, no one around. I go sit on the step outside. That's quite nice, just to just to take two minutes for, um, by myself. So, um, so yeah, and we we're here to support you. So, before I open to questions, um, just in that chat box, is there anything that you can you share? Anything that you've learnt? One fact that surprised you, or anything that you would do differently as a result? You're still there. Everyone wants to go to their lunch. The amount of people that go for doctors, for yet? One in three visits. Yeah, that's, that's staggering, isn't it? Being more open in conversations. Yeah, fantastic. It's okay not to be okay. Okay to have that chat. Don't worry, none of us will have all the answers. Um, how many people it affects? Is that really? I think, yeah, massive, isn't it? One in, one in four adults, one in ten young people. Just reassured you, that's good to hear. Hopefully you're feeling a little bit more confident now. I think that's the, the thing that lots of us are doing good things. Men be more affected. And I think one of the challenges, yeah, so thinking back to that statistic, 6,000 uh, suicides each year, 75% are men. Men are underrepresented in, um, in services. Um, and uh, sorry guys on the call, but I think there is still this sort of challenge for, for men around seeking support. So one of the things that we've done is partner with the English Football League to try and reach out to men and talk to them in a way um, that's, that's more appropriate and that you know it doesn't have to be all touchy-feely um, as well. Brilliant. Okay, so thank you so much for giving me a little bit of feedback there. Yeah, sadly, Beck, I'm really shocked too, and it's it's really sad about how many people take their own lives each year. So yeah, that's staggering. But the more we talk about this, and the more we get support, um, the better. So um, now I'm going to open up to you guys. But if you want to unmute yourself, um, if you've got any questions, if you want to um, unmute yourself and ask away, I will hang on the line for the next uh, 10 minutes or so. But just to say, um, you did great. Thanks for coming in. And ask away. So we, we do, we have a three hour course um, that's delivered by Local Minds um, around particularly mental health in a sports setting. Um, so you can find details on our website uh, or slash sport. Um, but there's also lots of other training. Oh, so we had a question a second ago about worried about the mental health of teachers, I think. Okay, so there's two there. So um, they pop up quickly, so um, I'll try my best. So there was one about worried about the mental health and well-being of your teachers because of spiteful comments from parents. 
And do you want to unmute yourself so we can have a chat if you're comfortable? Um, I've got a few ideas there. Okay, so um, on, on that fact around looking after your, your staff, I think that, that is key. Um, and workplace, um, uh, workplaces have a responsibility as well. If, so if any of you are like operators or employers on the call, two-thirds of people um, Two, two thirds of people are struggling. Tell us that the workplace affects their, their mental health. Sorry, I'm just writing down the questions at the same time. Um, so two thirds of people said that um, the workplace had an impact. So we have got lots of resources online on our workplace section. Um, so mind.org.uk forward slash workplace. Um, I think getting it on the agenda at a staff meeting is really important. Having uh, an open conversation about how we all doing, sort of a barometer check is, is, is important. Um, we also have a tool called uh, a WAP, uh, Wellness Action Plan, which is great. And it's a, a way of getting employees and employers to understand one another and think about, for us all to think about um, what support we need when we're not feeling so great or we're feeling stressed and what we can do to look after one another and what our employer can do as well. So that's a great resource and we're going to have some more CPD events around this in the sports sector. Um, because if you, particularly if you've gone through a difficult time with a parent or challenging conversation, um, then I think that checking in is is key um, and looking at how you can support somebody through that. So um, employee assistance programs. So often many employers will have like a council in line um, and access to free, uh, usually six to eight sessions of counselling. And um, there was another question about. Uh, I'm trying to remember them. <laughs> okay, quickly. Um, staff. Um, oh, here we go. I found them. Uh, so right, I'll take the one on adult swimming um, and PTSD. So someone that's had a past drowning incident and suffered PTSD. Now that that is um, that's quite an interesting um, situation and probably one that's worth to to have a chat about offline because um, that's quite individual. Um, and I'm sure you've probably tried lots of things um, already. So very happy to, to stay on the line afterwards to have a chat about that. So PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and I, I would imagine certainly um, going very slowly um, with that individual would be needed. Um, and perhaps get an input from if they're, they're receiving any therapy as well. But yeah, happy to stay on back and have a person-to-person -person chat on that one. Uh, are there any resources for Senko and mental illness? So I think, um, uh, again, a great question. There is an overlap between um, mental health problems and um, uh, disabilities. Um, we are just piloting a whole school approach and um, doing work specifically in schools and upskilling um, them. So that we have some resources already. There is a resource around uh, autism and mental health, um, but certainly happy to look into that. Charlotte, if you want to drop us an email, we can we can certainly check in with colleagues about what else um, is available. Uh, okay, and then Kim. Um, We'd love to deliver specific sessions. Should I start with the mine website? Yes, Kim, that's great. Um, actually, have a look at where where you are in the country. Um, see who your local mind is. If not, get in touch with us at uh, sport at mind .org .uk. Um, um, and we can see if we if we're delivering a sports project um, with the, the local mind. So we've just funded a number of local minds through Sport England to deliver um, programmes. And if not, we can probably help make an introduction. We may know someone. Again, every local mine's different. Some are tiny. Some are sort of large charities um, themselves. A question about are children with special education needs likely to suffer, men more likely to suffer mental health issues? There has been some research so uh, around uh, certain um, certain uh, impairments. Uh, so we talked already about autism. Uh, may be more um, likely to develop sort of common mental health problems like anxiety and depression, also um, deaf children um, as well. So thinking about the, the, the social isolation uh, challenges as well. So many of the other uh, charities um, 
do deliver programmes around this. So I know certainly the National Deaf Children's Society, for example, has an emotional health and wellbeing uh, programme because they're very aware of the challenges and obviously they're then experts in the, the primary condition, the, the deafness as well. So yes, it, it can can be more common because of the um, the, the, the extra barriers that people face um, as well.